Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Andrew. That was a very good introduction. In fact, I think he said everything that needs to be said, so there's no need for anything else. Um, all right. Um, I, I thought that um, I'd like to share this topic with, with you, and I have to be very, very frank. I thought that there will be like three persons, which is Andrew and, and the other guys, so I wasn't sure what sort of um, impact or, or interest it might generate. Uh, me, personally, I, I have to tell you that this is a discovery. Um, it is a journey of discovery. It's by no means the, ends to, to, the end to everything. Uh, what I'm sharing with you has only been an experience over the past six months, but I believe it can go much, much, much further than this. So if I can accomplish this in six months, imagine what you guys can do um, in the many, many years ahead. Okay? But one of the first things you need to do is you need to have an iPad. Okay, so that's a given. If you don't have an iPad, um, my colleague Vinod is there. We were just chatting just now. He has a Samsung Galaxy Tab. Oh, those guys copy Apple, so it's close enough. But there is, it's different. It's, it's the same but different. Okay, and and I won't talk about uh, other devices so much, but um, I believe if you have a tablet, uh, any tablet, you can actually do the same things that uh, I like to share with you today. Okay, uh, before I begin. This is a very strange room because the two screens split, so I'm not sure where to stand. Uh, I, I would actually like to move around. Now, one of the shortcomings of technology is that it's never reliable. And on a good day, uh, really on a good day, I, I treat my, my electronic gadgets like, like people. On a good day, they actually work. Like today, it doesn't, meaning I can't Bluetooth the iPad to the iPhone. If you can, the iPhone can become a remote. So you can walk anywhere and you just uh, use the iPhone as a remote. So how cool is that? Uh, unfortunately, that's not the case, so I'm going to have to stand quite close to here and I flick the slides. All right, a couple of things to dispel uh, some myths. Um, I'm not an Apple employee. I'm not, I don't have any Apple shares. So uh, I'm an employee of Taylor's. Um, if you don't know, um, I'm the dean of the School of Architecture, Building and Design. And that might be a bit strange to you. What's a dean got to do standing up here? Well, uh, before I was a dean, I, I was very much into gadgets as well, and I think um, I like to bring the two together. So what I did last year, in the middle of last year, was I decided that um, one of the things about uh, being a person in charge of a department is to uh, what they call model the walk. Model the walk means to actually put into practice the things that you say. So I decided to offer a class, and... Uh, this class is um, nothing to do with iPad, but it hinges on the entire story of Apple and um, the devices that they make and how wonderful those things can be and the impact that it can bring into teaching. Some people ask me about the extent of my use. For example, do I use it for assessment? No, I don't. Okay? And I think there's an area that you can, but again, I'm still exploring it. This is just version one, so it's going to be just um, very preliminary. Uh, another myth to dispel is that um, if you were at the, sorry, I just have to do this. If you were at the um, annual dinner, yeah, that was me, okay. Uh, all right, so that was me at the annual dinner, all made up. All right, so this is what I really look like today, uh, on every other day. And um, also when I go home, my kids, uh, I have two boys, a girl and my wife. We're all Apple users. My wife has an iPad. She has uh, just converted from a Nokia to an iPhone. I told her, please get rid of your Nokia phone. I said, if you left your Nokia phone on the desk, you come back next week, it's still there. Uh, if you put your iPhone on the table, within minutes, it, it's, it's walked away already. So she's lately become an iPhone uh, user. Uh, she bought an iPad after me. Um, my son has an iPad as well, iPhone. Uh, the whole household uses iPhone. I'm uh, sorry, Apple products. So uh, my kids um, think I'm a geek. Uh, they actually, uh, they're growing up. They're about 14 and 13. So one day, I like what the question my older one asked me is, Dad, what is a geek? And I said to him, um, you know, somebody who's um, like really into tech. <laughs> I was being to talk about myself. Then he said, oh, then he walked away. Then I called him back again. I said, um, so you think your dad's a geek? You know, I, I, then he said, yeah, from what you said, you, you must be a geek. Um, OK, if you're an Apple fan, we don't call it, and I'm one, you, we don't call ourselves geeks. Apple fans are Apple fanboys, okay? <laughs> geeks are Windows people. Um, but on the other hand, if you are somebody who doesn't like Apple products, 
then you are what you call ABA, ABA, anything but Apple. Okay. So hopefully, if you're here, you're a fanboy, fangirl. Uh, you're not an ABA, uh, or maybe you are, but you. Hopefully, by the end of this, we can sway you over a little bit. Okay. Topic for today's talk is iPad as a teaching and learning tool, and um, this is the outline for today. I'll, I'll give you a short introduction to mobile computing. And again, we have probably in our company here people from the School of Computing, so uh, I'm by no means an expert in computing, but uh, just from my experience, which I think might open your eyes to see things a little bit differently. Obviously, introduction to the iPad. Uh, iPad is a teaching tool, where it's a teaching aid and some of the applications and demonstrations. Uh, further adding as well, some of the challenges or shortcomings as well. And the conclusion, a very long conclusion, and then questions and comments. Uh, I don't believe in questions and answers. If um, I believe I've given you a lot of answers during the uh, presentation. If I haven't answered you, then then I failed. So hopefully it's questions and then maybe more comments or comments from from you as well. Okay. All right. Um, what do we know about mobile computing? And in a nutshell, I think this picture encapsulates what we think mobile computing is: a person who is uh, on the move, and you notice that the person is actually uh, walking about, carrying a bag in one hand and a device in the other. And surrounding this person is the landscape of the city. Uh, I come from an architecture background, so this is very appropriate for me. And around that as well, you know, there's all these sources of technology in terms of telecommunication towers, satellites, etc., etc. The thing that is, the, the key word here is uh, mobile, and being mobile em enables you to basically cut loose, all right? Uh, one of my classes that I teach students, I tell them that um, there's a benefit to moving about. For example, studies have shown that if you sit in a chair for an hour, you shorten your lifespan by 22 minutes. So if you watch, uh, m let's say you watch a show for an hour, and it's a really bad show, then you waste it an hour and 22 minutes of your life, okay? So it's good to be, you know, to, to be, be able to walk, not to be sitting, not to be tied to a, a table and a computer that sits on the table. I think in, in a nutshell, that was, that's what mobile computing is. Now, the genesis of mobile computing wasn't so um, sexy or so amazing as you might think. Uh, some people attempted it in the beginning, and I think when uh, people want to be mobile, um, there was the monitor, and the PC, and the keyboard, and this is what the device, and of, of course for something like this, somewhere right behind the butt there, you need some Apple, I'm sorry, you need a battery pack of some sort. Uh, so the first generations, uh, second generation of mobile computing as well, was not very, very successful. But I think it's always been an innate thing for human beings to, to move about, okay? That is um, why God gave us legs in the first place. So. I'd like to take you on a, a slightly different tour of why uh, mobile computing came about. Now, um, the digital revolution, as we know it today, is relatively new. So a lot of it came about due to advances in um, events of the world, for example, the Great Wars of the world. So we had World War I and World War II, and World War II ended in 1945, and um, after that, due to the inventions of, um, uh, of warfare in terms of machinery, communication, and all that, um, the advent of technology was really on a steep climb. And one of the things that happened in the 1950s onwards was there was this call for people to become uh, workers. Now, you and I are workers. I, I obviously work for someone. Otherwise, I won't be here. Uh, and there are two forms of workers in this world from the 1950s onwards. All right. And I think this one captures it quite well. So there's smiling people. On one side, there are the people in the factories. And on the other side, there are the people in the offices. Okay. So I think we are generally mostly office workers. Some of you may be in service industries. Some of you may work in factories. Okay. Sometimes the lines are a little bit blurred. And so that's the scenario from the 50s onwards, where people were either working in factories or offices. Generally, that was the condition of um, the world at that time. And we won't even talk about agriculture because agriculture was on the decline. So being, uh, where you were working on farms and all that, uh, being in decline, the, the prospect of working in a building 
in an office setting among people similar to you in either a factory or an office from the 50s onwards um, became very, very popular. Now, factories and offices, as you know, uh, have evolved over the years. And when I say evolve, they don't necessarily have to become, have become much better. Factories, for example, went through a, an evolution from people doing things to machine taking over. And now machines can build machines in factories. Offices become places that are a bit more confined. And I've worked in an office like this where I spent eight hours a day looking at three sides of my cubicle. And I was fortunate enough to stare out of a window, a huge window, and I always told myself, this is not the way to live. I did that for four years and then quit. Um, but you, you do get a window, which is your, window, your, your monitor, your computer monitor. And I think that's the scenario that we're at. Um, not the best and quite alienating. So working in a factory or working in, in an office, you know, it was just, you know, it can really get to you. Okay. I, I think there are days when we, we, we feel this way, you know, when, you know, we, we just really ask ourselves, why are we doing what we're doing? And I said, I've often asked myself that because I believe time is very precious. And why waste time if you can spend time doing things uh, that you enjoy or being very productive in? So why did that happen? Uh, that happened because of something called the CPU or processor. Okay, again, I'm, I'm not a te technical job expert, so I won't give you any technical jargons. But just to tell you that CPU or processor is the brain of a computer. And the components of a computer, for example, you see on the right side, uh, where the CPU sits at the top. And then there's all the components that I'm sure you know of, your, 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 your CD-ROM, your storage, your memory, uh, your hard drive, which is storage, your monitor, you need to have power supply, you need a keyboard, you need a mouse, you need a case, you need fans, you need uh, soundboard, video card, speaker, zip drive, floppy drive. Wow, that's a lot of stuff. Okay? So it's leading to, to my argument that how can you be mobile when you've got... We're encumbered with so many things. Any of you ever seen what the inside of a computer looks like? I have. I have tried to fix computers. I'm quite a handy person at home. When things break down, I, I literally fix it. It's tough. It's really, really tough. There are days when um, I try swapping hard disks, upgrading, things like that. It's just really, really tough. The jargons are just <laughs> immense. And, and who, who, who invented this? I have no idea, but it mustn't be very smart. And it, it gets worse. You know, again, you can talk about then also mainframe computers where they get bigger and then you know, they, they, they sit in the room. They, they sit in the room 24 hours, 24-7, 365 days a year, full air conditioning to keep it cool. Otherwise, the heat generated by these machines would melt themselves down. Okay? So that's where we're heading. Right? And as, aut as factories and automation and um, offices become more and more sophisticated, the move was towards bigger machines, more powerful machines, etc. The most powerful machine at the moment is in China. Um, I'm not sure how many times faster than the one it is, the one that is previously the fastest in America, but now America is trying to build the fastest supercomputer again. Um, so with that, obviously when you have the hardware, you need the software. So the software, uh, interestingly enough, is called Microsoft Office. Now this is where I think you start to see things slightly differently. Maybe you use a PC and you say, okay, you know, um, you know, I need my, my PC and I need my Microsoft Office and I've got my Word document. Uh, no, I've got, I've got to work with Word document, Excel, uh, PowerPoint, some of you use Access, Outlook, blah, blah, blah. You know, the whole suite. More the better, isn't it? Um, it, it, it just shows that when, when we are heading this way, that uh, my argument is that when you look at how things are, are moving in the digital revolution, the digital realm, we're becoming so encumbered with so many things. Even Windows, um, Microsoft Office has four versions. You know, there's a home basic, there's an enterprise. So it's like trying to land four jumbo jets on the on one runway. Okay, it's not impossible, but it's just, you can try it. You know, it's just really, really tough. Okay, and do we understand any of this? No. It's really, really difficult to understand. So, here it is. This is a typical setting. You know, if you're in an office, basically, you are staring at a screen. Uh, I like the way that Microsoft calls it a window. Uh, it's hardly a window. Um, 
but you're actually staring at this illuminated screen, you know, eight hours a day, and, and there's little social interaction. Uh, you tend to be either on the phone, maybe that's the extent of talking to someone, but some, the next person to you may be, you know, maybe sitting across a partition like I, like I used to experience. So it gets worse, okay? So as we go and we go along, as we move along, this, the world seemed to be heading for, um, towards a, a position where you know, people were just very much um, attached to their screens and very isolated from one another. Okay. So uh, this is a long one, but if you have the time to look at it, maybe the, the slides can be given to you. What it argues here is that the desktop PCs as we know it from way, way past is something that is going to be very archaic very soon, if not even now. And it says here that um, if you read from the um, second paragraph, Microsoft won this era of computing evolution and successfully applied that technology abroad, across a broad range of devices that take, let you take your office wherever you need it to be. Okay, you bring your office on your big desktop, in a laptop, or a tablet PC, or even in a smartphone. That's the software part. But like I said again, how many of you really understand all the things that go into Word, Excel, or, or the spreadsheet, or your PowerPoint? I use very little. And I think, let's be honest, how many of you really utilize all the things that you need to utilize? Very, very few. So it says in the third paragraph, uh, tablet PCs and smartphones that emulated offices fail because they lack relevance. And the same can be said for pedagogy when teaching practice fails to respond to the impact of meaning of new, a meaning of new pervasive technologies with the office metaphor out of the picture and things begin to slow down, which is why Microsoft's share price has flatlined as they cling on to, the meeting, to meeting the needs of the past, whereas corporations like Google and Apple have seen a very different future. So if after this you go back and you're going to sit down your PC and your laptop and you know, it's chained to your desk, uh, think again, okay? This is not the way to go. Okay, if you are, this is the legacy of the Microsoft era, of the office, which is literally an office setting. Okay? Uh, but I think the, the effect is that it actually ties you down. It, it makes you uh, very passive uh, in, terms of your, in terms of your activities that you could otherwise uh, be more mobile. So something, somewhere, something went terribly wrong. Okay, how can people, if you are evolutionists, um, believe that uh, we came from uh, animals and then we progress to a stage that suddenly then we become animals again, um, hunching over uh, a, a little desktop, okay? Now, so what is mobile computing? And I think it's good to just give you a bit of definition. Uh, there are a few. So mobile computing is using a computer, one kind or another, while on the move. So basically this is to, this is a contrast or the paradox to the idea of something that is very fixed, something that you would sit at the desk, uh, something that has perhaps many components which you don't understand or maybe you don't, don't need. Another definition could be mobile computing is when a work process is moved from a normal fixed position to a more dynamic position. So we can walk about, I can go from a place to another. I have to admit, sometimes the iPad goes into the toilet. Um, it happens, but uh, you have to wash your hands, that's all. And, um, but it, it keeps me working, okay? It keeps, it keeps me on the move. A third definition could be mobile computing is when the work process is carried out somewhere where it was not previously possible, I like this. So if you guys haven't taken the step to take it into your classrooms, this is your chance, okay? We are lecturers, most of us, and I think when we go into the classrooms, what do we take? I remember my teacher in school, you know, used to take a bag and ruler to canus and a pen or pencil and, you know, chalk, and then it was all chalk and talk. Um, today, what do we bring? I go to my class, I, I just bring my iPad, that's it. I don't bring anything else. And in fact, I go to, to the extreme, I tell my students, I don't want anything hard copy. Everything, send it to me, soft copy, and I'll show you some applications that you can use to do that. So in a nutshell, mobile computing can be said as an umbrella term used to describe technologies that enable people to access network services any place 
anytime and anywhere. Okay. Now, if that sounds appealing to you, oh, that's a lot of work. Uh, if that sounds appealing to you, then this is what mobile computing will be able to offer you. Okay, so mobile computers, uh, for example, laptops, palm tops, PDA, cell phones, pages, sensors. We don't have pages anymore. We used to, people used to carry pages. Uh, like I said, it doesn't matter if you don't have an iPad because uh, you can have palm tops. They used to be popular as well. I remember having the Palm Pilot. Then I bought a HP, um, one of those um, touch, you know, with the stylus thing. And um, so those are also forms of uh, devices that come under mobile computing. Okay. And uh, what do they do? They enable you to be anywhere, anytime, uh, and you are connected all the time. All right. It brings compute brings computer communications to area without pre-existing infrastructure. This is very important, I think, as the country as Malaysia is going to become a developed country by 2020. This is the move. All right. Instead of you know having powerpoints, plugs, um, bringing power to people in terms of you know this sort of utilities and services, mobile devices can be used anywhere. So imagine a kid in a kampong in a rural area. This is the answer to, to how they can learn and learn better. It enables mobility, obviously, as I mentioned. You know, if you sit down for an hour, you shorten your lifespan by 22 minutes. I stand up when I eat, when I can. Really, I literally make it a point not to sit at home. Uh, and try it. It's, it's good for you. Enable new applications. And I think if you guys are into developing apps, some of you are, and a lot of young people nowadays are CEOs at 20 years old. They, they came up with an idea of just writing an app, posting it up, and they make tons of money. Okay? It, it's a possibility as well. And the last one, uh, as I'm sure all of you are researchers, it's an exciting new research area for, for us as well. You can actually write papers on it about mobile computing. So this is mobile computing. This is not mobile computing, okay? So if you, just, if you still have a PC at home, uh, sitting on your desk, please get rid of it, okay? Uh, <laughs> that's not mobile computing at all, okay? And mobile computing isn't walking to the toilet and coming back either, okay? All right, so what is an iPad as a teaching tool? I like this one. I was just at, at the library the other day, and I was just flipping through. This is a very current issue of expatriate lifestyle. Uh, you can get it at bookshops. And uh, a person named Adam Johnson, deputy headmaster of the British International School, said, and he comes from a perspective of a, of, a, uh, of a school, not a tertiary level. He says a teaching aid would be something that helps a learner to learn. A teacher, as a facilitator of learning, uses teaching aids to provide a more stimulating and more interactive style of teaching for their students. Teaching aids have evolved dramatically over the last 20 to 30 years, from the humble piece of chalk to today's very sophisticated Interactive whiteboards with thousands of interactive capabilities. iPads, Kindles, and laptops have also become successful teaching aids. Teaching itself has evolved. This is the, this is the part that's good for us, is that teaching itself has evolved along with these teaching aids, from simple chalk and talk to an interactive experience, to an interactive experience sorry, covering all learning styles. So he's recognizing that even kids in his school this is the British International School, which is a secondary school. They're talking about this. We're at tertiary level. If you're not doing it now, it's okay. But if they're not doing it in secondary school and even primary school, then it's going to be really bad for us. Okay? So we've got to catch up on this one. Now, uh, I think it's always good to develop uh, an understanding of why we do things. So I'd like to share with you why I got interested in some of these things. I'm, I'll be 49 this year, uh, so I remember growing up as a kid uh, and up to now, there are two events of my life that really, really made any significance to me. The first one was when I was a kid um, growing up in the year 19, 1977. I remember going to town with my dad, my family went to town, and, and at that time the, the old Cathay Cinema. Do you know where the Cathay Cinema in Bukit Bintang is torn down already? And for the next two hours, I, I didn't really understand what was going on, but when I came out from the cinema, um, I remember saying to myself, I have never seen a movie like this. 
I went to watch a movie called Star Wars. And before that, I had been fed on a diet of Bruce Lee Kung Fu movies. You know, Every time my father took us to the movies, it was always Bruce Lee and Kung Fu. Or Ti Long, or David Chiang, the one-armed swordsman. You know, that was a classic. The guy can fight better with one arm than, than two. Uh, so when I watched this movie, I, I remember coming up and, and everything just seemed so different. It was just such a, an amazing movie, you know. I've never ever experienced a movie that, that talked about the future and about this love story in the intergalactic world and gosh, it was amazing. Um, I remember then turning around to my dad and saying to my dad, right on the street, I said, Dad, can I go and watch the movie again? My father said, no, uh, because we were very poor. To go to town at that time when we were growing up was a major expense for my dad. He used to tell us that he used, when he took us to the hotel to eat, he would order a dish and the kids would share it. I didn't know this. But that was how poor we were. So for him to take us to the movies um, was, was a major event. And, and when he said no, I felt disappointed. But I decided no, that was, life didn't end there. So I bought the book, I read the book, and I even... Gosh, this is telling too much. I even um, wrote a play in school based on Star Wars, uh, come up with some friends and say, you know, we could do all these fantastic things, you know, with fireworks and crackers and all that kind of stuff. And, and I collect the toys. Up to today, I'm still buying Star Wars toys. I'm a collector. Okay? Exactly 30 years later, in 2007, I saw this picture in the magazine and I'd never seen a phone like this. This is the second experience in my life that really, really changed my life and I think defined who I am today. I'm not a sci-fi person by, by any means, but I've always been very curious about things. I grew up in a very humble uh, setting where I had no shoes, so I tell my students that I, I love shoes. I have, sh I have shoe fetish because we never had shoes when we were young. So I love shoes. I love women's shoes, men's shoes, whatever it is. And um, before that, my first phone was given to me in 1993 by my future wife. She bought me a Nokia. She said, you need a phone. I said, no. I, then she said, yes, you do. I said, okay, if you, want, you, if you want me to have a phone, please buy it for me. So she bought me a Nokia phone. And it was great. And then I upgraded and upgraded to a... The, the last thing I had was a smartphone was the Sony Ericsson, the one with the stylus. It even had the flip, like the, you know, the very fancy, like, a, well, you could flip it open. Uh, but it had a stylus, which was really hard to pick. And I thought that was great. I thought it was great. Then one day I saw this in a magazine. I read the cover. I read the story from cover to cover. And I tell you, those guys at Apple, they really know how to sell you something. Right? The release of this device took six months to arrive. Uh, I had a friend here who was going to America, so I said, look, can, you, can I bum you some money and please get me an iPhone. You know? So she brought me back an iPhone. I think I was probably one of the first few people in this country, in this room at least, definitely, to have an iPhone, the first iPhone. And everything that was just, they said, you know, that it was a touch, multi-touch device. It could do all these fantastic things. It was just amazing, amazing. I used to fix computers, like I said. I do a lot of fixing things. I used to have phones that when they break, I fix them as well. But this one has no buttons. It has no way of doing things which I understood at that time. Oh, but before I bought the phone, I actually have to reveal to you that I actually went to Apple shop and bought the iPod Touch. At that time, it cost, for 16 gig, it cost 1,600 ringgit. I just said I had to have it. <laughs> now with 16 gig, can, you can buy it for 800, 600, 699, okay? So I, I played with this thing, I fell in love with it. Um, I think my wife started to say, you know, hey, I don't see you very much anymore. Uh, and, and I just thought this was amazing. And there's no turning back ever since. Okay? So how did the iPad then come into the picture? I'm going to tell you another story. Okay, that's the story of my life okay, so far. Uh, maybe there'll be another new discovery soon. Now, it was the year 2000. There was a very, very rich man who went up on stage, like, like I am now. He went up on stage on this to a, to a huge crowd of um, techies, very rich men. He said, he showed them a device that looked like an iPad. He held it up and he said, this is the future of computing. Now, just to reinforce that, in the following year, in the year 2001, he went up on stage again at Comdex and he again said, this is the future of computing. 
Now that famous person is not Steve Jobs. It was actually Bill Gates. Bill Gates actually came out in the year 2000 with a tablet PC. Now, I don't know how many of you remember the tablet PC. Okay, probably not many, because it was unsuccessful. Uh, he had one up, and he said, this is the future of computing for the, in, the, in about five years from now. And he was quite right. Um, it was built on a technology called Surface. Surface is another thing that I remember seeing as a video. It was so amazing. It, the Surface is like a desk this big, all right, with a huge screen. And in the video, they had people sitting around and doing minority report kind of things. They were shuffling things. They were tapping on this. And, and things were just happening. And, and Microsoft looked like it was on its way to become, you know, to revolutionize itself, even. OK, but that didn't happen. Somebody stole his thunder, and that person is Steve Jobs of Apple, the former CEO. And uh, I like this one because they're here they're, they're having this so-called banter of my Mac runs Windows, and of course you know that he stole the program. And my Windows runs the world, ha ha ha, uh, but it still sucks, okay? And um, the story goes like this, that one day um, Steve Jobs was, was uh, somewhere, and, they were, and he was seated next to some uh, Microsoft people and I can't remember, it was a bar or something like this. And they were talking and they were just like saying, you know, oh, we should, we should build, a, we, can, we can build a device like a tablet, you know, and we can make it really good, and this and that, and this and that. And he was overhearing them saying this. And so the next day he went back to his office, he got his people together and he said, uh, four letter word, uh, we're going to make the best tablet we can ever make. We're going to make it better than Microsoft. So he set his engineers a challenge to beat this guy, and that's how it came about, okay? So, but before we go any further, let's talk a little bit about what is an iPad. An iPad or a tablet, okay? Uh, I like to show this one, which I showed my colleagues the last time, was uh, tablets have been around for a long time, okay? Uh, we might think that it's something very, very new, and I think uh, Moses led the way when he went up to the mount and he got his uh, commandments from God, uh, up here, you can see that, uh, sorry, up there, you see he's getting his commandments, and God gave him the Ten Commandments on tablets. Then he came down the hill, and he showed it to them. He's, there he is holding it. Looks a little like an iPad or a Kindle. And then uh, people, you know, knew what to do from then on. Okay? So it seems. And yes, you know, if you ever go look at an iPad queue, the lines are the same. <laughs> there are people lining up then. There are people lining up even now, okay? Except now you can buy an iPad. Uh, last time it was given to God by to Moses. So this is a typical scene of an iPad queue at Covent Garden. Uh, if you're in London, and iPad lines are, are, are not as long as iPhones, but they, they do generate a lot of interest as well. And just as a just as a note, if you are planning to buy one, the the iPad 3 should should be announced next week uh, for a slightly higher price. Uh, but it should be much better than the current version that we have available in the market. So, Steve Jobs actually said that this is a this new tablet computer. He actually said it is a new tablet computer. It's a truly magical and revolutionary product, as uh, Andrew mentioned. He continued that what this device does is extraordinary. Extraordinary. It is the best browsing experience you've ever had. It's unbelievably great way better than a laptop, way better than a smartphone. Now, if you have a smartphone, and the iPhone is a smartphone, or you have a laptop, like the MacBook, you know, which I, I have both at home, and I've used both, you find that they're both different. And the iPad is also different. It sits somewhere in between. So in a way, also, in terms of marketing, you've got to buy a smartphone, you got to buy an iPhone, you got to buy a MacBook, you got to buy an iPad to get the full experience. Okay? But this is supposed to be the, and this is the only time he has ever actually called his product revolutionary. So, he then he then mentioned that uh, a couple of things are very in, in, interesting. If you actually if you actually go watch the um, video of his presentation, uh, the two things that stand out to me is one that he says Apple is about um, Apple as a company is about looking at making products from two points of view. One is obviously uh, technology, and technology is the, it's at the forefront of what they do. Uh, they used to be called Apple 
uh, Inc. Apple Computers, Apple Inc. They've dropped the Inc. and just become Apple because they don't want to be constrained to just selling computers, but also other devices as well. So technology is there, but also at the crossroads of technology and liberal arts. And I think this is very important. If you are a design person, uh, I'm a design person because I was trained as an architect. In the liberal arts, we talk about design, for example, or creativity, or, and the products that you look at, Apple's products, they are, they are very, very beautiful. Okay? Somebody has actually sat down and thought about the design, put a lot of thought into why they design it to look this way, and good design, for your information, should be very minimal, all right? not, not with a lot of bells and whistles. And the iPad is very good design because all you need is just what it is. You don't need a keyboard, you don't need a mouse. In fact, you cannot hook up a mouse to your iPad. You can try. It can be done, but normally you can't. Okay, I'll, I'll teach you how to do that later. So that's it. You just have this slate, and the design is so minimal uh, the, the current version is tapered at the edge that when you look at it from the front and even from the side a little bit, it looks like it looks really, really, really thin. The first one was slightly thicker and the second one is actually much, much thinner. So technology and liberal arts, they are the only company that can do both really, really, really well. So for us who are a bit more design conscious, um, for example me, um, I would go for an iPad. Okay, I wouldn't buy uh, any other product because you know, just looking at it visually, it just looks right, it even feels right. There's something about feeling it. Uh, I tell my students that when they designed the iPhone, they actually experimented with the size and how it feels on an average hand. Okay? My hands are probably smaller than an average hand, but an average hand would be able to hold an iPhone most comfortably. And the other thing that he talked about was the different types of models that you can purchase. So these are US prices and the price for the new iPad 3 will go slightly higher. And uh, so you can get them in, in 16 gig versions up to 64, either with Wi-Fi or 3G. So my recommendation to you would be to get the highest capacity if you work with a lot of graphics or you just have a great stash of music because you can carry your music anywhere, get the 64 gig. The price difference is only 800. It's a lot of money, but it's a one-time investment. Um, I know I talk a lot about mobility, but you don't really need the 3G because the 3G uh, adds a running cost on top of your purchase, which means that you have to pay somewhere between 50 to, I don't know, about 70 ringgit per month to be able to walk around and serve the news and all that. I find that I don't really need that. I can just go to Starbucks or I do it at home or I come to Taylor's, you know, you can, we get Wi-Fi, all right? So get, so what I bought was the Wi-Fi 64 gig. I don't have the 3G version, but if you really, really want to be mobile, uh, there are two ways of doing it. Buy the 3G version or pair it with an iPhone. You can pair it with an iPhone. Your iPhone uh, in the latest OS 5 has something called personal hotspot, which means that it uses your phone as a modem. You can actually turn on personal hotspot. It gives you a code. You can link up to your iPad and you can surf. But you're actually charging your, you're actually paying for your carrier charges on your iPhone. So you got to know what your quota is and don't exceed that. Okay. And I'd like to tell you a story as well. This is my iPad sitting here. Um, this iPad is not just any other iPad. <laughs> uh, obviously, because I bought it, but because it's supposed to be Dato Lois. Loy take hands. Um, I bought it last year during when, when there was a shortage, when there was an explosion in the, in the, the factory, and then, and then people who were fast, not me, were saying, uh-oh, something's going to happen. So there was a huge... Uh, short supply of iPads, I don't know if you remember, just before Father's Day. So I was scrambling for an iPad. I just thought to myself, okay, I've told my program director I'm going to teach a class. Oh my God, you know, I better prepare. And it's all about Apple, so it's all about using iPad. I mean, part of it is about using iPad. I better go and get an iPad. Couldn't find one. Couldn't find one for weeks. I went to every Apple store in town. I can tell you all the, all the Apple stores are. I went back my friend at Sunway Pyramid. Jonathan, please, if you get an iPad, please tell me. So one day I walked to, what was it called? I Experience, is it? The one here? And Adrian, the guy's very nice. I said to him, Adrian, do you have an iPad? And he said to me, I mean, I've been there a few days, and that day he said, yes, I have one unit. Do you want it? I said, is it white? He said, no, it's black. 
statistics shows that most people will buy the black one. If you have to buy black or white, get a black. Because black is more suited for professionals and also it will last you longer because it won't go out of fashion. Whereas a white one, people perceive it as a little bit more fun. Okay, so survey has found that 70% 70, 70 of people will buy the black one compared to the white one. Okay? So I said, yeah, okay. No, then he said, no, it's black. I said, oh, is it 16 gig? No, it's 64. Oh, man. You have to pay that kind of money and get a black one? And he said, yeah. So I said, okay, I got to have it. You know, I will pay my 2099. And then I said, well, you know, how come you have this iPad sitting around? He said, oh, somebody didn't want it. So I said, who is that? So he said, let me check for you. And he went and checked. And he says, this is actually booked by Dato Loy. Is it? I said, yeah. <laughs> I said, wow. So he doesn't want it, huh? Okay, I'll buy it. So I actually own Dato Loy's pre-booked wife, uh, Wi-Fi 64 gig iPad. Okay, you can you can go tell him that. Yeah, I, was, I went back. I went back home and I told my wife, I don't know, like I probably afford the Wi-Fi in 3G. Like, why you won't buy the Wi-Fi? You know, no, no issue to him. So this is the introduction to the iPad. So um, um, probably. Probably Steve Jobs was the right guy to do it. Um, a little bit of homage to him. Uh, he's he's really the 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 really the, the inventor of our time, honestly speaking. Okay. All right. So comparison in two zero zero seven we have the iPhone, twenty ten the iPad. Okay. Form factor, uh, the screen for the phone is about four point three inch. The iPad is nine point seven. Of course, it weighs a lot more, uh, but it's comfortable enough that you can actually hold it in your with one hand or two hands, you can rest it on your lap. Uh, in fact, in the presentation for the iPad launch, uh, which was great, uh, um, Steve Jobs actually sat on stage and used the device in a chair. Uh, you have to look at his presentations. His videos are very interesting because they're all about marketing and sales. And <laughs> the way the guy presents things and how he sells you the product is, is just happening right before your eyes. So he, was, he wasn't seated at a table. He was sitting comfortably in a sofa chair and browsing. So how much better can that be? You know, my animations are not working. Um, I don't know why. OK, so oops. All the animations are not working, sorry. So uh, another thing about the iPad, which is probably of interest to you is, and why it's so popular, is, uh, sorry, is that it comes with um, a lot of other, I know you said, I said something about bells and whistles, there are some bells and whistles that come with it, but they are called accessories with, that, come to it, uh, that come with it, so when they introduce the, the iPad, the new generation iPad, they also introduce a smart cover, which is, I think, a really, really good idea of buying a cover that attaches on the side magnetically, and it actually covers your screen, and it, it, it turns it off when you close it, and it, when you flip it open, it wakes up instantly. Okay? So the animation, sorry, the animations are not working. It's a multi-touch device, obviously, you know that by now. So no buttons, no keyboard to speak of. There's a virtual keyboard that you can call up and type. It's, and just not type, uh, type with your fingers, correct, sorry. Uh, there are accessories you can buy in the market, and again, I'm not selling you uh, Apple products, but um, this is just from experience. You can buy the Lady Gaga cover, back cover, the skin. You can please don't buy something like that on the right. That is so ugly. Uh, people do sell things like this. Um, I, I went on a search to find, because it's a very slim device, I went on a search to find the slimmest bag I could find. This is the slimmest bag I could find. This is how slim it is. So it comes with a flap. And you can slip it in. There's enough space for you to put an iPhone. There's a latch in the back as well. Um, if you want to look a bit more uh, professional, you can get a leather cover. Oh, this is a smart cover, as mentioned. And the red one is uh, you can't find in the store. You have to order it online. And it's a, it's a red product, so part of it goes to charity. And when you get an Apple product, please make sure that you cover every single centimeter as possible because it's made of glass and aluminum things which are highly breakable. And so this is the back cover of the skin, and this is the front cover. And it sits in a, in a cover itself. Right? It comes with a, um, it comes, you need a 30-pin a connector. This is called a 30-pin connector. 
and it's a standard device for all Apple products for iPhone, iPod, iPad. Uh, there's talk that they are going to revise the 30-pin connector to make it smaller, but actually, uh, apparently, there's a there's a move worldwide to standardize all devices to a USB connector. But the USB connector is is really big. Um, this is the end of the USB connector, so I don't know. I'm not sure what's going to happen for for the future. Okay. You can also buy accessories like this. Um, now accessories are not necessarily great. There's a lot of things that are not built into an iPad. For example, the ability to uh, put in a memory card. So you have to buy one of these connectors. So what this connector does is it allows you to put in a SD card. So I take pictures with my camera. I stick this in the bottom, and it's always at the bottom. Mm -hmm. and, and then you stick in your SD card. And the amazing thing is it reads it automatically. It reads it, and it just downloads. Okay. The other piece is just for you to stick this end to this end, and then you can charge it as well. Um, there are a couple other things you can buy. Uh, so be careful when you, s when you buy accessories, you can spend a lot of money, okay? Because you love your iPad so much, right? Okay, <clears throat> now, the, now the exciting part. Okay, to get the other things out of the way. Now let's talk about applications. Applications, there are many, there are tons. Um, it is said that between iPhone and iPad, iPhone has more apps because the iPhone was introduced in 2007, the introduction of the iPhone also introduced apps, or sh apps are uh, short form for applications. And I think on the iPhone, you can get something like 600,000 apps. On the iPad, there are about 250,000. In terms of downloads, uh, Apple is reaching about 250 billion, billion downloads. That's you and me downloading whatever we want, okay? 250 billion. If you go to, I don't have a Wi-Fi connection here, but if you go to App Store, there's a countdown. If you're the 250 billionth person, they'll give you 100,000, no, 10 or 100,000 dollars worth of apps for free. So, <laughs> uh, good luck if you're lucky. And um, apps uh, are what makes the iPad work, okay? And without apps, your iPad is just a beautiful looking device, shiny, uh, great to look at, uh, but you can't use it. So I'm going to show you some apps that you can use. There are certain stock apps, meaning that when you get it from the box, they, they come um, pre-installed. So for example, Contacts, Maps, iTunes, App Store, FaceTime, Camera, Photo Booth. Um, those are stock apps. That means they come for you to basically do a few things. One is have fun. Photo Booth is great. Uh, if you hit on Photo Booth, and the iPad, the, the new iPad 2 has a front-facing camera and a back-facing camera. Uh, the advantage of which is if you have phone photo booth for either iPad 1 or iPad 2, it's great. You can just call up any one of nine um, things, and here you are. This is me on thermal device. So you can take a snapshot of yourself, just hit the snapshot, and mix for fun. Because the first thing my kids discovered was photo booth. And they took pictures on themselves, and you, all the pictures are saved. So you can, you can have kaleidoscope pictures, you can have really, really funky things. Okay? And um, contacts, uh, just contacts of all the people that you know. They, they list them down uh, alphabetically. And maps, you need a Wi-Fi connection so that you can then search where you are in the world, as well as wherever you want to go. iTunes and App Store, be careful with those. Those are the ones that you spend money, okay? iTunes is where you buy music and you buy videos. And once you hit that, they, they entice you a little bit by giving you some free videos, free songs. Every week, there's a free song, a free video. If you like it, then they have something called Genius. Genius is great. It basically tries to figure out what you like based on your existing collection of music or videos or what you're searching. And then it gives you a range of things that it suggests that you get. So it's amazing. Um, the iTunes store is, like I said, be very careful. You can spend a lot of money. But most albums are about $7.99 when they go on sale. Otherwise, new releases are, new releases are about $12.99, $14.99. Then they settle down to about $9.99. Convert that times three. It's cheaper than the stores. So I buy music on iTunes. App store is where you get all the other things. Okay, all the things for you to do, 
to, to enable the, connect, the, the functionality of your iPad, again, very careful. <laughs> App Store can run your account dry. And um, once you hit that, there are categories for you to look at. You can go from education to books to productivity to maps, everything, language, anything is possible. Anything that people post up. Like I said, there are about 250,000 apps for the iPad alone. FaceTime is great. Uh, it's the same as the iPhone 4 in that you can actually call someone and there's your, there you are. Uh, I mean, the person's face appears in a small box in the screen. If you ever tried FaceTime, it's quite fun. You need a Wi-Fi connection. And when you call someone who has an iPhone, it has to be the same device. So you can talk to that person, and that person is like talking to you. It's almost Skyping. Uh, camera is camera, but there are better ones in the market. Uh, I'll show you some. Remote is, I believe, is free. You can download that. It en 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 enables your device to become a remote. Now I realize why I can't sync my phone to my iPad. is because I forgot to download my remote onto my phone. Otherwise, it can work. Videos is just where you dump all your videos, and videos are great. They now the the only problem with the videos is that there are proprietary things that you can do. Um, you have to purchase from from the apps from iTunes. Otherwise, uh, there is a way of doing it to to download illegally and then save it and play it. But it's very finicky. If you buy on your MacBook, it may not play on your iPad because of certain restrictions. So Intolerable Cruelty is one of my favorite movies. Uh, the two most beautiful people in the world. See, it doesn't, there's a place. Okay? And the, the quality is pretty good. This is HD, high definition. It's not, sorry, this is not HD. Okay, this is by no means is HD yet. So if it's HD, then it's even better. Okay, I think it stopped. Yeah, I cannot play, see? After a while, it tells you you can't play. Um, it can't play, meaning you can't show it as a movie to a part, as an audience. There's a restriction to what you can do. Um, I think the interface is in the connector. The connector you have to buy is a dongle-like thing here. It costs about 119. It allows you to hook up your iPad to, to your projector at home or to your screen that you have. You can view it on the iPad, but it doesn't allow for public viewing. So there's certain restrictions. I, I don't know what it is. Okay. Uh, Google is Google, you know that. Um, this one is better, Camera Plus, which has more functionality than camera. So you, when you go in there, there are filters, there are editing tools in there, they're much better. Instagram is another one that if you like looking at, if you like to take pictures, again, I can't open all of them for you. Just, just, you might want to just search them out on your own. Um, again, it's another tool for you to take pictures and, and manipulate, do manipulating. The, the greatest news, the latest news, if you guys are into graphics, is... Photoshop has just been released for iPad for $9.99. It's very expensive. But again, it's cheaper than buying Photoshop in a box. $9.99 is 30 ringgit for Photoshop. That is amazingly cheap. Uh, box is something that I, I haven't used yet, but I use Dropbox. I'm going to refer you to Dropbox. Dropbox is something that you must get. Okay? And as a lecturer, using a, an interactive device, whether it's a laptop, PC, tablet, Get Dropbox. Dropbox is free. Um, when you load it, it gives you two gigs of um, storage for free. Basically, you sign up with an existing account and it gives you two gigs of storage. And the two gigs of storage allows you to put in anything you want. Movies, PowerPoints, my, all my teaching notes are posted onto Dropbox. They're stored in Dropbox. Okay, so this is what Dropbox does. Oh, gosh. Okay, if, if there's an internet connectivity, it will show you all your files here. But it's stored on the server offsite. The beauty of Dropbox is I have Dropbox on my iPhone as well. When I want it, I can call it up on my iPhone, I can call it up on my iPad, any device from one server. So two gigs is a lot of space, guys. I've got 12 weeks of lecture. It's all there. My notes, my readers, everything is in Dropbox. What Dropbox is, is it gives you a link. It will tell you to the student, instead of giving them files, you know, a lot of us have a tendency to download files for them. You're clogging up space, guys. What you do is go to Dropbox. There's a, after, you do, after you've loaded into Dropbox, there's a command for you to link it by an email address. It will give you an HTTP address. Andrew, I hope it works. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't work? 
It works, eh? Dropbox. If you have, oh, there it is. Dropbox is amazing, guys. Here's my, some of my lectures are here. You can call it up. It takes a little while to download. But the beauty is you, you're not giving students tons and tons of space you know, that's clogging up the, the network lines. You're just giving them a link. And that link comes from that little chain that you see at the top here. All right, when you hit that, it says either email link or copy link to a clipboard. And then you can, in my case, I Facebook my students. So when I Facebook them, I tell them, please go look at this link. I don't tell them where it comes from, it doesn't matter. And when they tap it on their device, it leads them to this and they download it. So it's, it's a great thing to have. Uh, it takes a while, so never mind, I, I won't show you the rest. And um, you can also download your photos. You know, my dad's birthday, he had an 80th birthday, so all the photos are there. Uh, anything, anything. It can take a lot. Two gigs is a lot. Box is similar. Box gives you 50 gigs free for a limited time. I think the time has passed. It was a lot of gigs, but it was trying to compete against Dropbox. Uh, Dropbox was, um, I believe Apple tried to buy Dropbox, but they, they, they turned down their offer to, buy, to sell because they knew that they were on a really, really good thing. You can upgrade by buying more, but you have to pay to get more storage. But again, two gigs, I find, is enough for me to do one semester's worth of teaching. Um, GarageBand, you have to buy. It costs $9.99 if you're into music. Uh, I started learning drums last semester. And uh, as a device, my iPad is my music sheet. I don't have papers anymore. I just download the stuff, I put it on the pedestal, and I read my sheets. Or better still, what I do is, I was showing you some videos just now. Um, I, I download videos, I put it there, and I try to s simulate what they're doing. It's a great way of doing things. Um, Office HD, Office Square HD, you can buy. It's quite expensive. Um, I can't remember how much it is, but it is the only, it's one of few applications that you can open Excel, Word, and PowerPoint. You cannot create any of these on iPad yet because apparently Microsoft is coming up with their office <laughs> on iPad soon. But at the moment, you can upload those things. Again, you can link it through our Dropbox. When you, when you go to Dropbox, and you, when you, sorry, when somebody gives you the link and you download it, it asks you to open in. It gives you a list of things open in this thing called Office HD. It presents the format as it is and allows you to edit in doc form, Excel, and PowerPoint. It's the best in the market. Google Plus, uh, again, the social network. Newsstand, we don't use very much. It's one of the things that a lot of people hate. Um, again, it's like iTunes and App Store. You go in there and you buy things. You buy um, magazine subscriptions and all, but not very successful. A lot of people don't. And you can see it's empty because there's nothing on the, on the shelf. The amazing thing about the iPad and the apps is that a lot of things happen. You know, when you buy a book, it shows up there. It's a little icon. Snapseed is free for, was free for a while. Uh, what I do is I, I get a lot of news through something called Flipboard. Let me show you Flipboard. Flipboard, you must get. It was the app of the year last year for iPhone. On the iPhone, it was, it's a different experience because you're flipping page by page. But um, here, on, on the iPad, because of the larger size, you're able to see it as tiles. On the iPhone, it comes as small tiles, and you've got to flip. It's very difficult to do. But it was app of the year last year. It's free. And what it allows you to do then is you customize it according to your name. Once you get your name and your password, you can then use it on the iPhone. Just put in your name and your password, it will set up exactly the same thing that you have on your iPad or your iPhone to your iPad. doesn't matter. Okay, so one name, one account. And you can choose. There's a whole list of things for you to choose from on the side. Everything. Not everything is available. Anything that is there, you can use for free. All the news, the, 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 uh, if you're into news, there's a lot of things. Now, the beauty of Flipboard is it pushes news and information to you things that you otherwise cannot find. So for example, how do I know that Snapseed was uh, free? Because I've got a few of these uh, websites. Oh, that's IU. <laughs> OK. Uh, so I go to look at apps. There's a website called Apps. 
and they, it's all the news about Apple. I read about Apple every day. I'm sorry. I, I, I just need to know what's going on. And they tell you what's the free app for the day or the week in America. So 24 hour, about a 24-hour difference, usually apps are free for one day. When you see for, it's free for one day, download it. Otherwise, you have to pay for it. And there's a lot of news, a lot of news that comes to you. Okay, I think it's a form of, I think they derive their revenue from advertisements, obviously, because these will link you to iTunes or App Store or the website. And, and some of it is just pure information anyway. So details is good because uh, it's a men's kind of thing. Um, so from Flipboard, I found out that Snapseed is uh, available for free. Otherwise, it costs, I think, about 10 US dollars. And it's a great um, application for you to do uh, presentations, files, and all that. Okay. Uh, iTunes U, Goodreader is another thing similar to Office. Uh, Goodreader, I think, allows you to open PDF files. Okay, there are certain limitations about the iPad is that PDFs, they don't treat PDFs very, very well. You cannot extract PDFs. In fact, it doesn't need to do that. On the iPad, it just reads it or it doesn't read. Okay, so it just does everything for you. iTunes U is new. This is the move from, by Apple to get into education. So iTunes U is where, when you go in, it's similar to iTunes and App Store, a lot of things to buy. Things from universities, they download papers and presentations, you can buy them. Or this was one that I was interested in, it's free. So you can download certain things for free. And some of these are running things. So when there's, there's a new um, uh, upload, they will tell you and then they will automatically give it to you as well. Okay, so iTunes U, and U is for university. Uh, bamboo papers is good. Somebody was asking about stylus just now. I, I don't think I want to go back to stylus, and it's a bit archaic. In fact, one of the criticisms that they said about um, uh, about multi-touch devices in the beginning was you have to sharpen your finger, you know, until you, it becomes a point to be able to use it. So bamboo paper is quite good because. And I think my colleague up there was asking because you, uh, you can now buy the full version. It allows you to draw. So you can draw and then you can, I think it's shake to shake, you can shake the device to erase and you can turn the page. Page after page after page. So it's one of many, many, many that you can get in the market. Um, another one's penultimate, it's the same thing. Reminders is another stock app. It just sends you reminders. It tells you like you got a meeting or whatever it is. Okay. A couple other ones. Touchpad is for you to link between your PC, your lap. Sorry, not PC. <laughs> no more PC. Um, your Mac, iMac, and or your your MacBook and your iPad or your iPhone. It allows you to link, meaning that you're at home, your MacBook is on, you know it's on, and you're on your iPhone. You know I want to get something. Touchpad allows you to talk to each other through Wi-Fi. A uh, couple other ones, uh, just for fun. By the way, the way that uh, it, it's, a, it's also a very good device because it allows you to be very organized. So on the first page, for example, are the things that I usually use. Okay, it's, it's like a filing system. Every time you turn it on, this is the first page that comes up. So obviously you want to have all your favorite apps on the first page. Okay, and then as you go from screen to screen, then you get other things. So the, the less important ones come about. Okay. So there are a few that are for education. Uh, I found there's one called Teacher Tool. And some of these, unfortunately, are very teacher-based. Teacher, teacher, you know, seriously. Uh, I know lecturers don't like it, but these are very teacher, teacher type. So you do things like timetabling or absent. You can even take, um, you can record absences without the, uh, all on, all, all on some of these. I haven't really tried these, um, but I just, demo, I just downloaded it so you can see. Another one called Teacher Helper. This one, again, similar. It's more for like you to just keep up with what's going on, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then um, I've got folders as well. So these folders are for me to, to keep things. And again, if you haven't experienced an iPad or iPhone, uh, what you need to do is you need to touch on one of the icons. They will wiggle. Uh, and then the X tells you that you can delete. If you want to delete the app, you can delete it. Or you can, once it wiggles, basically it's, it's unlocked from its fixed position. So you can then uh, say this one is blackboard. This is a blackboard thing. 
you can take it out and it comes out. And if you want it to stop wiggling or change anything, just tap on your home button again and it stops. So it's very easy to use. And then later on, for me, it depends on what you do. So there's some games you can download, obviously. Um, this one is actually very close to Facebook at Modo. The interface looks very much like Facebook. So if you are a Facebook user, that model should be very, uh, very familiar to you. I think they've done it on purpose because they, 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 you know, in Facebook you've got this where you can put your profile, your walls, and all that, and then all your, all your postings here, and then some ads and all that. So they've done it to look very, very similar. I think this is one that we we might want to, Chileong maybe look into some of these apps, you know, that you can use maybe on a more um, holistic basis. Otherwise, people will be using different different things. Okay. Now, another thing that um, you notice is also there are apps on the bottom, and all these apps, uh, some of it are stock apps. For example, Safari. Safari is the equivalent of Internet Explorer, uh, where you can surf the net. And Photos is where you deposit all your photographs, or it, it saves it for you without you telling it. Mail is where you get your mail, so you have to configure your mail settings. Right, uh, Keynote. Keynote is the one that I've been using for my presentations, and Keynote is equivalent to PowerPoint. So, uh, in terms of how much it costs, it's nine ninety nine, guys. That's cheap. I bought it. Um, I bought it because there is a way to get free apps, and I don't know whether Andrew allows me to tell you how to do it. <laughs> but buy it because I told my students I'm going to teach you. I'm using for teaching. So since we don't want to do any copyright issues, I bought Keynote. But there are a lot of things I didn't buy. Okay? It's 9.99. The interface is very, very easy. It is a light, very, very light version of PowerPoint in that you don't need a lot of stuff. Like I said, why do you need so many things to, to basically just project video, um, pictures and, and words? Keynote can do it for you. The only limitation about Keynote at the moment that it doesn't allow you to do is it cannot allow you to embed videos. Okay, uh, not yet, but the day will come. Okay, that, that kicked out again. The day will come when it allow you to embed video into your PowerPoint, into your, into your presentation. So my presentations are here. Uh, the thinking architecture one is my class. You can also do the same thing like the wiggle. You can put folders into folders and create larger folders. So it's a way of, you know, compacting your your presentations. Okay, it's a very basic. Maybe I'll talk about this one a little bit more. It's a very basic um, application that allows you to do a lot of things. For example, um, it allows you to change, sorry. If you're selecting a, a picture, it allows you to change what kind of picture effects that you want. You can have a border, you can have a shadow, mm -hmm. you can have a mirror reflection, etc., etc. If you choose uh, text, it can allow you to choose what font you want, what style, justification types, types, titles, body, bullets, whatever. Uh, colors, size, obviously. So sorry. Uh, you created your presentation on your iPad? Yes. It's, it's done on the iPad. So you, don't, so you don't have to create it on your MacBook? Anymore. No, I don't do that anymore. I don't use the MacBook. I don't use any. In fact, I have the identical. PowerPoints, I mean, identical keynote slides on my iPhone. Uh, the gentleman was asking whether he can do it. It's actually possible. Uh, I can go to class, hook up the same thing on my iPhone. There's the slides are there. And although it's small here, it comes out the same there. So it's the same thing. Can be done. Okay, I've tried it. You can download a PowerPoint, but the settings run. Yeah, so no. I, I would, I'll tell you not to do it because. The problem with the thing about PowerPoint is you can customize a lot of things. I, I do give it to you that PowerPoint is very powerful. That's why I call PowerPoint. But when it comes, when it's imported into Keynote, um, a lot of the complex commands are absent. So things will run. 
lari, uh, really lari, seriously. You look at it, you go like, oh my god, you know, what is this? Um, the one I do, okay, I'll tell you how to do my, I, how I do it on my iPad is basically, I know what I want to do, and I create a template, and then I just keep going and going and going. And along the way, uh, because it's just a button push away, then I go to Safari and I look for the things that I want. Images, uh, things come up, you know, things that I want to talk about. And then I download the, the images. And when you go back into Keynote, this one here, this button here, this button here, allows you allows me to select the photographs that I downloaded. So for example, this one. Right? And then you can size it by tapping on it. And then with one finger drag, you can make it bigger, smaller. There are guidelines you can turn on, so they tell you where it is. You can justify in the middle of the page. The, the, these guidelines appear. If you, you watch this now, uh, they, didn't, they didn't show up until you, you start to move it around. So it's a very simple, intuitive way of doing it. Um, if you want to delete, just tap and delete. That's it. Very simple. Text is the same. Once you type text, then if you... Uh, the other thing about, that's nice about setting pictures, because I know some of you are very into PowerPoint, that you want everything to be the same, 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 like me. Uh, and so let's say this is the size of the image that you want. So when you tap on this image, you tap on... There's something called replace. You can replace this photo with, say, this photo to the same size. So you don't have to, like... Again, I don't use PowerPoint anymore. It's just way too much. And it costs hundreds of ringgit, right? It's crazy price, you know? This one allows you to just do everything. It does it for you. Very, very simple. And the, the file sizes come out to be very, very small. Megabytes. Not even gigs. Mega, megabytes. So everything is done. This is a hidden slide. So uh, if you hide it, it just collapses. But everything is here. Now, if you want to start your presentation, uh, this is what you do. You play it. Uh, there are a few ways to close it. You can, it doesn't work here, but if you're working on it at home, you can just pinch your fingers, just pinch your fingers and the thing collapses. And then your sidebar shows up again. Very easy to use. It's the simplest thing I ever use. I mean, I've used a lot of PowerPoints, but really too cumbersome, not necessary, okay? Messages is for you to record your messages. Uh, it's similar to a phone function. iBooks is where you buy books uh, from Apple, and they sell. Books are usually about two, three something, not too expensive. Uh, Dropbox, Flipboard, yes. So the images that we we'll be using in the ah, appear, now, appear here. Must be already in the iPad or in the internet. Must be on your iPad. Yeah, it must be here. Okay. It must be stored here. They're all here. Okay, so it's a repository for you to extract from. Okay, but be careful because you tend to then clog up your your storage. So what you need to do after you've done a presentation is go back and, and house do some house cleaning, delete a lot of these things. You you need to delete, otherwise it stays there forever. So all these were the slides I use for my presentation. You can see sometimes it's sequential. As I'm thinking, I'm thinking about what I'm going to do. I go search. And then it downloads, and then I know what I'm going to do next. I'm going to do next. So it's a way of tracking your thinking process as well. I find that everything I need, for example, Air Music, I don't want it to be here because Air Music, I bought it for $3.99. Um, it allows me to pair my iPad with my PS3 at home. So you've got a PS3 at home, you've got a great sound system, all right? And you've got your music on your iPad. What do you do? Buy Air Music, click it. it it's, it reads the, I, the PS3. It does everything for you. iPad, I mean, the, Apple has, has figured it to such an extent that it's so simple. It will then say, um, this device is, is available. You, you connect it, and you play your music. So I, I bought it because I just had to have it. Uh, and music is, is useful. Uh, there are two other applications that come under something called iWorks. Uh, it's a similar to Office. Office has your PowerPoint, your basic one, PowerPoint. Word and Excel. iWorks has Keynote, which is equivalent to PowerPoint, and two other things called Pages and Numbers. Pages is equivalent to Word. And again, under iWorks, 
it costs nine ninety nine each. So total total cost for you to buy iWorks three softwares is ten US dollars, uh, thirty US dollars, twenty nine ninety seven actually, which is about less than a hundred ringgit. If you buy your home basic office, is how much? Two three hundred ringgit. It's it's amazing. So this one is equivalent to Word, but again, it's a very stripped down, easy to use version. You don't need a whole lot. You can import pictures as well. See the icon here? It's the same thing. Okay, it does exactly the same thing as Keynote, except it's Word format. Okay? And then pages, uh, that's pages. Um, numbers I don't use very much because I'm not a numbers person. I'm not an Excel user. But if, you have, if you're into Excel, you can use that, and it will tell you if there's some updates. It will inform you. Pretty intuitive. Huh? So, for example, I did download this which is our timetable. Uh, so the file is quite big. It takes a while to, to load. So you can see your timetable. allows you to repository for you to just you know, make sure that you have it when you need it. OK? So that's, oh, then you've got uh, other things like calendar. Calendar is obvious. Notes, also very obvious. It doesn't come with a calculator. So you can go on the net and get free calculators. Okay, that one's uh, up to you to get a lot. Uh, Unicorn is um, is a is a utility app for you. It's a, for you to do conversions, uh, weight conversions, um, volume area, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. YouTube is YouTube. YouTube, as you know, you can go to YouTube, but you cannot save videos. So that's why you should hack your iPad. Honestly speaking, honestly speaking, Messenger is a subset of Google where they actually extract the, the they extracted the the message part of it, and it allows you to just read your messages very very quickly. Uh, TED is uh, TED Talks. If you all use TED Talks, depending on what you teach. For me, I, I do a lot of discussion, so I go to TED. TEDtalks.com is amazing. They've got people like Sir Ken Robinson. He's a great speaker. Anyone. Steve Jobs, everything you can get from TED Talks, and they're all free. Okay, uh, and then you can group them under travel, about languages, etc. Uh, under travel, you can you can have TomTom. Tom. Um, this one is another one. Sijik is a, is a similar to Maps. It's a GPS. Uh, it is GPS enabled map locator. So it gives you maps of uh, different countries like this one, Singapore, Malaysia, Southeast Asia. You can have the U.S. as well. Okay, okay. So th those are some of the apps that you can, you should, you should have or you will have. Um, there, there are many, many more. Okay, two hundred fifty thousand is is quite a lot to, to go through. All right. Okay. Let me finish this part. So, what are the opportunities? To me, I think there are a few. Uh, there are four opportunities when you come to talk about. Uh, the iPad as a tool. Number one, the all-encompassing thing is that we are in the digital revolution. We're in the digital age. Uh, we're no more at the age where we're still um, using sticks to, to make fire, you know? So either you embrace it or your students will overtake you, honestly. And when I go into my class with an iPad, I think what's funny is um, the students don't, don't flinch, you know? They, they, they don't even look at it like, in fact, they say, wow, you know, you, you know how to do it. The first time I operated Dropbox, I got congratulatory message on Facebook. Well done, sir. Well done. Wow, I said, like, okay. Um, so when I could speak their language, Dropbox, Google, well, Google is nothing, nothing. When I said to them Dropbox, they looked at me like, wow, you know what's Dropbox? I said, yeah. <coughs> when you can speak their language, you, they, they are interested. They're interested in what you, who you are and what you have to say a little bit more. Okay? So the traditional approach of going up there and saying, all the thing I know is, is contained within here, and if I want to tell you, I'll tell you. you know, if I don't, too bad. It's different. Digital revolution is a free market for all. Either you participate or you're left out. Okay? I think even in, in, in North Korea, for example, <laughs> uh, that's a good slide I have, um, with the great leader, you know, they, they have to, although they're very far behind, you know, they still have to... to to deal with this uh, digital age. 
Uh, notions of learning are different now. Time does not exist. There's no such thing. Students are <coughs> 24-7, 365. And I find that most students, uh, they will tell you, they actually do their learning at home and on odd hours. When we are asleep, they are awake. When we are awake, they are asleep. That's why they are always sleeping in your class. <laughs> and um, honestly, they are nocturnal beings. Uh, they do their studies at night or any time, whenever they want. Starbucks, Mama's store, late at night when you're sleeping. Honestly, they are online. They're online. Okay. So mobile computing, I think, offers you the opportunity. Uh, learning without frontiers. This is uh, obviously where. You, I like this saying, you cannot get the most out of an iPad without letting the student own it and harness their personal accounts, tastes, and media for some creative learning. So on Facebook, for example, I have a very face, active Facebook account where I chat with them. And this is, to me, this is amazing, guys, because and, um, I'll, toot, I'll toot my horn a little bit because I didn't know this was going to happen. When I first met them, I said, Okay, I'm going to teach this class. And then they liked it very much. And then we, they said, I told them, I said, okay, although I'm the dean, I'm the dean of this school, uh, one of the schools here, I don't like Blackboard. And they said, yay! So they were all so happy. They said, sir, let's get Facebook. I said, oh my god, I don't know how to use Facebook. And they said, don't worry. So one of them made me an administrator. So okay, then they put up these people, the members on my wall. So they all signed up, and I became administrator, so meaning to say that if I don't want to allow someone in, I can. Well, that's a lot of power, you know? <laughs> so 28 members, uh, including me, I had 27 students. And from that, we decided to, I decided to post things to them. Up to today, some of them have gone overseas. We've agreed to keep this post up, active and running. We post videos, we post discussions, we talk about anything under the sun. Uh, I just gave them one on sound. This is an amazing site called SoundCloud. If you ever go to SoundCloud, well, I don't know how to describe it. Um, in a nutshell, it's like this. I found it because it was saying that when you have an iPhone and you turn off your iPhone, there's a clicking sound. That clicking sound is a sound of a vice grip. You know it's a vice grip? One of those things that you use, if you click a vice grip, that's exactly the sound of an iPhone shutting. So the whole experience of technology is that technology is, is an inanimate object, but the sounds that it emanates gives it a, pers a particular personality or life. Now you can have Siri. I think Siri is the, the latest thing about iPhone where it can talk to you. But what's amazing is every nuance about your iPhone but you're turning it on, click, sending an SMS, sending, receiving an email. These sounds habit 99% of the invisible world. In fact, it leads you to a website called 99 Invisible, where people post up sounds of the funniest things you never imagine. And you go like, is that what a washing machine sounds like? And then they use it in presentations. They use it in devices. So it makes your device a living thing. And it says, if you don't have sound, our world doesn't exist. So I, I found it and I posted it. And some of them, they will like it. They will say things, blah, blah, blah. And it leads to other discussion. And with the students, I can tell you, their memory span is very short. After a few comments, that's it. They're off to something else. But some of them will then take the initiative to, to give me certain things. And I have a running thing with Melissa where I always poke her. So I'm going to poke her back. And um, so... It's, it's an online discussion. What I've decided to do, uh, I told them, if they agree, that every semester when I run this class, I'm going to have new students, but they're going to remain active on this wall. So I envision in a few years, I'll get hundreds of people on my wall, and we we'll just be participating. Now, not every, 28, not every 27 members say things. Out of the class, I get about five active ones. But the five contribute, or the 20% of the Pareto's Law, I think you know, 20% give you 80% yield. 25, 4 or 5 people will be very active. But I believe the rest are just looking. And they're just, you know, on the sidelines. But when this grows and grows and grows, by the end of this year, I'll have 
close to 90 students. Next year, another 60. Years from now, before I die, it might grow to 100. And, and all of it is just keeping a discussion going. I, I didn't envision this would happen. But this came about because um, it was a class talking about just sharing ideas about things, you know. And, and I think as designers, we have to understand phenomenon so that we can do design very, very well. That's why I told them, whether you're an architect or whatever it is. So we look at movies, um, a lot of YouTube, uh, Vimeo. Vimeo is another good site. Vimeo for, for videos and TED, TED Talks. Okay, Sunny is very quiet. All right. Um, so iPad helps us move further away from the office metaphor. Again, if you're still using office, why? <laughs> Remember, you work in an office and you use office. Gosh, you're going to be enslaved for the rest of your life. Uh, metaphor of learning and into new, personalized, anytime, anywhere, learning metaphors. The fourth one is form factor. I think the, form, the fact that you can have iPad, if you can borrow, all right, here's an iPad. This is equivalent to hundreds or thousands of books. All right, uh, airline pilots are now using it, where previously, you know those pilots, when you see them walking, they're, they're all very impressive, of course, and they have this big bag. They're actually carrying manuals. These manuals are for them when they sit in the plane. They have to have the manuals. If there's an emergency, they have to refer to the manuals. Now everything is on the iPad. Medical doctors are going into surgical rooms with iPads with apps, medical apps, to show them different, different things. I've got one that I bought. I thought it was quite fun. called Elements. This one I paid a lot of money. This was $9.99. But I really told myself, this is really worth it. If you are teaching science, chemistry, it gives you, in an interactive way, the properties of the elements. And you can even look down here. Or you can go up to Wolfram Alpha. Wolfram Alpha is, is actually contains a lot more information. You can you can gives you, a, you know, very interactive. You can spin things. You can read. So it's informative. This is the way education is going. Students can see it in their own hands. They can read it anytime they want. They can play with it a little bit. Uh, and it saves a lot of money because, like I said, the price of books is, is very cheap online compared to, to buying it in, in hardcover. So something that is, say, um, next slide, something that is, uh, the possibility of carrying around hundreds or thousands of books in one device is a compelling argument alone to consider getting textbooks to be digital. I think that's the way things are going. Okay. Now challenges, I think there are mainly two. One is technology cannot replace humans. Uh, there's this fear that, oh, you know, if the iPad and computers can do all this, then why do you need teachers, lecturers? Uh, you can't because of something called human relations. Obviously, you still need the person in front of you telling you things. A, a computer cannot think on its own. It cannot feel. It cannot make judgments. Okay? But we can. Okay? So there is a limit to it. But I think coupled together... The, the device and the person you can make for a very formidable team. And another challenge would be price. Obviously, it's expensive. Okay? Uh, an iPad, the cheapest iPad at the moment is 1499 That's a lot of money. And then you've got to buy apps. <laughs> and it loads up again. And, but imagine that if you're buying something for this price, $14.99, um, it's justifiable to buy some, a textbook at, say, $14.99. But the initial price of the iPad is a bit of a prohibiting factor, whether you can actually afford to buy it, or as an institution, are we going to buy it and allow students to use? I don't know. You know that's something else that we have to think about. Okay? I believe if you buy a lot, you can get a discount. You can actually discuss with them to get a discount. They give you a slight discount. Um, by the way, Apple has in its store an Apple education section. All of us are lecturers or administrators or students, as long as you have proof, you can purchase from the Apple Education Store, not the Apple Store itself, for certain items at 300 ringgit off, except iPads. <laughs> iPads, iPods, iPhone, is, there's no discount. So MacBooks and iMacs are 300 ringgit off compared to walking into a shop and buying it. So go to, go to the Apple Education Store. 
So in conclusion, and I said it's a very long conclusion, if you go and look at the uh, Apple website, this is the latest thing that they are now touting, is that the iPad is going to be the thing that previously changed everything, now going to change your classroom, okay? With the introduction of all things like textbooks, apps, iTunes U, et cetera. They're going to go and in a very, very big way into education. But let's just not forget that it's all about, education is all about human interaction, otherwise we won't be here. All right, um, and that's that's very very essential because a device cannot take the place of a human being. And I think this is where we are faulty. Uh, we are at fault. If a lecturer sits there and talks and the student is not looking at you, <laughs> this is quite normal. <laughs> what what learning takes place? Okay, and this is very very common. So in its place, uh, this guy I like, um, Sugata Mitra. Have you heard of him? He was born in Kolkata, India. He, he tried an experiment called Hole in the Wall. And what he did was to bake a hole in his office, outside his office, put a screen, hook it up to a fast-speed internet, and left it there. And kids came from all walks of life, but mostly very poor. No education. And they served the net, and they learned from it. He found from that experiment something called minimally invasive education that's the people, if given the right opportunity and devices to learn, can learn on their own. And this is a note for us in Malaysia. Most of the contents on the internet is in English. These kids don't read English, but they find no problem getting information. So that's amazing, you know, for, for us. And maybe classrooms should be more like this, where we actually, you know, talk. Uh, not really talking to each other, but a little bit better, you know. At least there's some interaction that can take place. But imagine the screen not being there. If the screen's not there, your iPad, then you can actually have an exchange. In my class, what I do is um, I ask them to rearrange the tables and chairs. We make a U shape, and I tell them I said I tell them to make a U shape because I don't believe in a U shape. Nobody sits in the back. Okay, even if you sit in the back, you're not really sitting in the back because it's a U shape. So then everyone sits in a circle, I sit in one place, and then we have a discussion. Everyone's facing each other. And I think we need to get technology into young hands very quick. There is some criticism about learning language with headphones. I don't know if any of you from Language Center. Some people say that's not a good way to do it because you're actually isolating the student by putting the headphones on. That's a traditional way of learning language. But there, if you read on the internet, there is some criticism about that, that you really need the lecturer to do something. You can't just get the student, plug in a headphone, and say, that's it. In fact, there's also criticism about the interactive board. And they said it's not a very effective tool. And coming from our visit to NTU, uh, I think we have to think about what is the most appropriate way of doing things. So in conclusion, long conclusion, is it possible to get from a, a young toddler to a little girl to a mature, you know, adolescent to, a, to, a, to an adult. And the common thing being that, you know, a device is always accompanying this person in all stages of growth. I think it is. All right? But, again, it, it, the answer is mobile computing where the iPad I, I, I propose to you or I submit to you is the most appropriate device, not, your lap, not, your, not even your laptop and not even your smartphone because the iPhone is just too small. I find that I have my, my lecture notes on my iPhone. <laughs> what am I doing? Uh, it it's looks nice, but it's just not practical. So when Steve Jobs says it's, he, he found the right answer with the tablet. He really did. And again, it came from Microsoft, thanks to Microsoft, where it's a form factor between the iPhone, which is way too small, a laptop that you can carry, but way too cumbersome, and the tablet really is, I think, the answer to, to this. So that one day, I hope, from the individual, then we can get to the masses. And the masses meaning that everyone uh, can get their hands on one of these devices, hopefully. Okay. This was a, uh, Apple gave uh, laptops to a school. So they took a, a picture of this and the mascot being in the middle. <laughs>